first of all, we have every, um, I don't know if right is the right word, but I mean, it's completely reasonable to take care of ourselves, right? Uh, if we can't take care of ourselves, then we can't be our best self with others. So uh, sometimes we just have to make a boundary you know, with people. That's one of the steps off the drama cutting, this final step. Sometimes we just have to make a boundary. And there are some relationships that we have to, uh, even family relationships, that sometimes we have to separate from for a time. Well, in some cases, maybe permanently. You know, we can continue to, uh, if we have that, aspire to that spiritual value, we can keep our heart open and wish that person the best and try to do our own work at finding forgiveness and so we can send compassion. But, you know, over there, right? It just not doesn't work for me to be in relationship with it's too damaging for me. I can't be in relationship with you right now. And maybe that'll change and maybe it won't, but I'm sending you all the compassion for your own healing that I can muster. And I'm also going to take care of myself. So I just wanted to present that more kind of extreme case to begin with, that that is totally okay. Then, you know, um, so you mentioned, you know, taking ownership for the own feelings and, and things that you bring to it. So realizing that in any relationship where, um, in any relationship altogether, and certainly when there's any conflict or unease or discord, Obviously, a lot of our own stuff is there, right? Because we all have a lot of stuff. We all have our conditioning, right? And all, so there's a lot of our own stuff. So just realizing that rather than getting into, you know, I'm perfectly fine and everybody else likes me. You're the only person I have a problem with, so it must be all you, <laughs> right? It's very easy to go to that place, right? So, um, but just being more reflective and, and realize, okay, I know a lot of my stuff is here and a lot of my stuff's getting triggered. And, uh, and so first doing that reflective work and owning that. And really not only owning it, but being curious about it. Like what is going on here? Why, why does this trigger me so much? And why does it trigger me in that way? And, and how does it trigger me? And when do I sort of get triggered into anger in this situation? And when do I get triggered into despair and wanting to give up? Or when do I get it, when, triggered into fear and wanting to just back off and, you know, or when do I get triggered into wanting to rescue the situation and thinking I can change this person and rescue them? And, you know, all the different places I can go on the drama triangle and so forth. So just kind of being really curious about all that because one way to look at the situation is, wow, here's, here's a relationship I'm struggling with. Wow, what a great learning opportunity. <laughs> I mean, that's not usually where we go. We usually just go, oh my God, this sucks. You know, well, how, how can I quickly change this or get rid of it or make it different because I don't like it. It's, it's, I'm suffering and it sucks, right? To make that shift and go, wow, here's an incredible learning opportunity, right? So I can get mirrored back to me all this stuff about myself because when things are just going along swimmingly and, you know, a relationship is in complete ease and somebody seems to be our big fan and everything's lovey-dovey, there's no mirror. Right? There's no mirror. And um, so we could be grateful. Wow, here's an opportunity that's mirroring back to me so much of my own stuff. And I could really look into it, learn a lot about myself and own that. And then I think that will, if we're really doing that work, that will set us up to be able to, you know, engage with another person where there's a good chance they will be able to experience in a, experience in a way, experience us in a way that they don't feel we're projecting onto them. They don't feel we're blaming them, right? They don't feel we're making them responsible for our stuff. And they, they, they feel like there's someone who's kind of in that place of owning and listening and openness. And there may be a greater chance that, the, you know, in some ways, if we don't give them any hooks, right? If we're not giving them anything to get hooked into the drama triangle with, then they can't play out their usual thing they might be playing out. And they might just be kind of saying, you know, oh, wow, this is different. You know, I, what's going on here? So that might invite them into a more reflective place. And then, of course, when we get into the, the actual, you know, conversations or interactions, you know, then there's lots of things we can learn to be skillful. Nonviolent communication, Marshall Rosenberg's work is a great, it's a whole, it's like, it's a very challenging methodology, but it's, it's really completely rewiring how we communicate and how we think. 
but some simple parts of it that have influenced the radical responsibility model are that connection between feelings and needs, realizing that our feelings are not caused by others, but that our feelings or situations, but our feelings arise out of the experience of our needs being met or not. In fact, not even out of the experience, but rather our perception of our needs being met or not. When I perceive my needs are getting met, you know, the universal needs we all have for love and safety and connection, and autonomy and respect and all, all the food, warm shelter. When I perceive my needs are being met, I have all the warm and fuzzy, pleasant emotions. When I perceive my needs are threatened in some way or not being met, then I start to feel fearful, anxious, angry, jealous, envious, you know, all the, frust all the more challenging emotions. So just having that insight can help me move into a more reflective place of ownership instead of blaming my feelings or assuming my feelings are really caused by other people. And I can then also check out my own perceptions. Are my perceptions really accurate? Actually, at best, my perceptions are a limited read on a limited amount of the available data in any given situation. And sometimes my perceptions are completely misperceptions, or at best, they're partially accurate. And where, how do I build my perceptions? Something happens, I start talking to myself, adding meaning to it, make assumptions, narrow my field of vision, find conclusions, go to beliefs, right? And all that's based on my conditioning, because what do I draw from to add meaning to situations? all my past conditioning, right? So it's all a narrative in some ways. The whole thing is all narrative, it's all stories. So if we have a story that's creating a lot of suffering in our life or in a relationship, try a different story, right? You know, we have these stories, especially in long-term relationships, family relationships, well, they always, and they did this, and it's always like this, and always, you know, but always and never, they never, you know, all that globalization. You know, we have this whole story. Well, if we could drop the story and stay of the story, you know, I don't know, this will sound maybe a little cosmic or new agey, but for whatever reason, I dropped into this life and, you know, my karma brought me into this family and I have this wonderful opportunity with all these fellow family members and crazy human beings to learn a lot. And, uh, and you know, with this particular person, I have this opportunity and, and challenge and I could really grow from this. I mean, it's a very different story. We can have some version of, you know, and when we tell the story to ourselves, like, Oh, uh, they never, and they used to do it, and they always, and you know, how do we feel? Well, we feel miserable, angry, and conflict, and hopeless. And how do we feel when, you know, I don't know why, but this is, you know, was my destiny karma to be in this relational field, and, and wow, it's, it's challenging and prevents a lot of opportunities for me to grow and, and move beyond my victim mindsets and really become more skillful in relationships. Then how do I feel? You know, I have a completely different feeling. So there's just a lot of places we can go with that. And one thing I would suggest, um, in fact, um, may, maybe I'll ask Eric to send out some uh, references, but if you even Google uh, difficult conversations or how to have difficult conversations, there's quite a few good things out there. And I, I have uh, quite a few of them. I used to lead trainings around that. So I have some of them on my computer and, and, and there's some really good, thorough guidelines, you know, about, and first it has to do with doing the kind of work I've been talking about, getting really clear about what's going on with yourself, getting clear about your own motivation, making sure your motivation is pure, in other words, mutual benefit, and then how do you set up a conversation for success, actually how do you open it up, how do you, you know, find the right way and time to have it where it has a chance of working, and then how do you, how do you go about doing it so the other person actually feels heard and seen so that they're more, they don't feel defensive. Because the minute we make somebody else defensive, that's all we're going to get is drama, right? So how, you know, so there's a lot of teachings around how to have difficult conversations, and I re really recommend exploring that. 